Made, presented by Longines, is a brand new series from FEI Originals that takes a deeper look into the equestrian world. On this week's episode, we go to Germany to meet award-winning equine photographer Karina Meivold. Scottish war veteran Harry Marshall tells us his story and how horses have helped him deal with PTSD. But we begin in the heart of London at the Ebony Horse Club to find out how horse riding is benefiting inner city children. Brixton's an area that's changing really quickly and obviously that's got some really great positives about it but people do get kind of left behind and we're seeing that as a community it's perhaps a little bit more unequal. Ebony Horse Club is a charity and we've been going for 25 years but the stables have been here nine years and we're just about creating new opportunities and helping young people kind of reach their goals and we do that by providing horse riding lessons, horse care sessions as well as youth work so I never really describe us as a riding centre, I always say that we're a youth club with horses. The kids that come here are all from the local area um, most of them walk here, some of them literally live in the flats that overlook the arena. So Ebony's always been about community and that's something that, that we still kind of hold on to now. They're all local, which means they're growing up in inner city London, which means that they don't normally have access to green space or animals, particularly horses. So most of our, our young people, when they come and ride here, they haven't ridden before. Some of them have never even seen a horse before. Ebony Horse Club isn't only a place where young people can come to develop new skills. They have the opportunity to get help in all aspects of their lives. I'm a youth worker here, so that's kind of doing everything from kind of looking after the young people, giving them one-to-one -one support when they're in, helping them for kind of progress in all kind of aspects of their life, but also kind of helping out with the horses as well. Without the youth work kind of side, I don't think we, we could really exist. I think the horses kind of make ebony, but I think the kids make it even more. It's kind of like they have their highs and they have their lows, and you'll see them in their good days and their bad days. But the kind of positives of kind of interventions like Ebony Horse Club um, have on the youth, especially kind of in like urban areas such as London. And it just makes a massive difference in kind of reaching their potential. I think they don't kind of realise the kind of skills that they learn, so that's kind of building relationships with horses because they might not be able to um, build relationships with people in their lives or have role models. So I think every one of us, as well as kind of the youth work team, we all kind of have a say kind of from the, all the way from their riding lessons all the way down to kind of the youth work sessions of developing themselves and getting them kind of apprenticeships or work experience or just kind of different avenues. <laughs> Horses are definitely really great levellers. As soon as the kids are on the horses, nothing else really matters. When you see some of the riding that our young people do, you know, our teenagers, they're jumping, they're doing quite complicated things, and it doesn't matter what your background is or what your income is or if you've got the newest trainers, you've still got to get your horse over that jump. Um, and that's what's so great about it. You know, the, the horses don't know any of that. They've still got to take on that challenge that's in front of them and really focus on it. So they're, yeah, re really good way of putting everyone on the same playing field. Having somewhere that they can go that is literally open, they can come up to our gate, we will let them in and help them with what we can. You know, it doesn't cost very much. We're here seven days a week and having a safe space for young people where they can just come and hang out and be themselves is super important. And I think it's really amazing the community that we're in. I don't think I've seen it anywhere else, just how strong like the kind of networks and passion for people and, and community is here. The parents and guardians get to see firsthand the benefits that a club like Ebony can offer young people and help broaden their horizons. It opens the, the, the world for the children because it, it says to them, this isn't, this isn't all you can be. When I see him um, riding, and if he gets a horse that's a bit feisty, he would like to canter and gallop 
and I think, look at you. Because I've had Adam, I'm um, Adam's nan, so I've had him since birth. And when I see him on top of this huge horse and becoming confident, just knowing that he can manage that powerful um, animal is, is, is brilliant. And it makes me confident that what he's mastered here, he will take into other spheres of his life. I think my love for horses was always there. I somehow think I was born with it. When I was a graphic designer, I also could own my first horse. I could pay for it and I bought it. And um, at first I didn't think of taking the camera to the stables. I don't know why I didn't mix it. I have no idea, but um, I came from an appointment um, with, a, with a dog. Um, that I had a photo session with um, and I wanted to visit my horse in the evening and I just sat in the in the meadows and um, watched the horse okay. and had my camera with me and took the first photos. I think that is the point where I knew this is something I was going um, to do for a very long time. For award-winning equine photographer Karina Meivold, photography is not just an occupation. It has taken her on a journey, not just around the globe, but on a personal level too. Yeah. I think I was spent my whole life figuring out what horses mean to me. Um, and I think that's one of the main drives I have in photography. Because there are so many different characters and many different philosophies. Um, how you can use horses, how you can spend time with horses, how you can even read them or communicate with them. and. Um, figuring out okay. what horses mean, not only to me, but also to the people, different kind of people all over the world, is something that will take a whole year or could also take 10 years or maybe my whole life. This is one of my favorite and most important pictures because if it weren't for that photo session, I maybe wouldn't be the photographer I was uh, or I am today. Um, this is a completely blind mare. Um, she can't see anything. And we had this very special photo session where we let her completely free and do her own thing. Somehow she, she made me realize that I should um, live in the moment and not think about what's in the future. Um, in that moment she turned around and ran away and I thought it's extremely beautiful how she walks through that through that bushes like a door into the light and the bushes are highlighted from the back in a really golden or maybe even reddish sunset which gives a dramatic feeling to it and her tail is like on fire which I love um, which gives us mare that's a um, very strong character look um, and yeah I really love it and it will be forever be one of my favorite pictures. I started with all of it because I knew the pain that comes with letting go of a horse and not having any nice photos. I want people to have that memory of the horse, like they're not only seeing the horse in front of them, but also how they see it in their hearts and how they can feel it. And um, that's something that um, created the biggest drive in me. I think it's important to get a lot of information up front. That's why um, when I'm talking to the client, I always ask about their story. Then I just observe the horse. I like to watch horses a lot. So while they're speaking, I, I see how the horse reacts, how their ears move, how their muscles move. Um, do they, um, are they nervous? Are they shy? Um, and I try to, to focus on all those little things and because these little things end up into this whole character I can show. When I go out, I always try to take photos of the horse, of that one particular horse in front of me. 
Um, I want to see the character, I want to see maybe even the history, the story of that horse, because every horse has a story. Um, so I want to capture that, I want to show that, and I also want to give the viewer of the photo um, the possibility to, to see something else on there, to, to think about the image and lose himself in it. This variety of the job is, I think, what makes makes it the most amazing job for me because you you never know what's going going to happen. Maybe it's just a nice afternoon spent with horses. Maybe it's it's a precious moment shared with people with the owners. There are so many different ways to to describe it. I I love every angle of that job, every every aspect of it. If I have to sum it up what horses mean to me, um, I would say they symbolize freedom and power and strength to me. But they are very, um, very soft also, they are very gentle and they are very loving. But then again they can also be very cruel. I mean there are so many different facets and faces and traits that they're there. There's, horses are everything, they are everything in one. And what you see in a horse is a reflection of what you carry inside yourself. And that's something I think what is fascinating about horses. For Scottish soldier Harry Marshall, traumatic experiences during a deployment to Bosnia would change his life forever, as he dealt with the devastating effects of PTSD. One night I was sitting at home and a firework went off and I started to go into a flashback and I didn't realise until I was sitting down on the side of the road that I was having a flashback and as I was sitting there breathing an innocent member of the public came by and they put their hand on my shoulder to ask if I was okay and because I never seen them coming I got startled and I went straight into a flashback stood up and ran head on my taxi at 40 miles an hour and broke both my legs, broke all the ribs on one side, smashed all my eyes up, woke up in any, and I was like, what just happened? I went to the recruitment centre, never told anybody I was going. I basically just turned up and um, I, was, I was asked to go to the two day selection and going course in Scotland and I intended to join the Royal Highland Fusiliers, same regiment as my brother. So I was selected and I set about training. When we got to the end of phase two of training, all the guys that were going to the Royal Highland Fusiliers were told that we would be fast-tracked. Yous are going straight, yous are finishing up early and yous are going straight to Warminster to do a, one, a week's pre-deployment training, then you go straight to Bosnia. It's called Op Harvest, that's the military term for the operation. You were detailed to then go hand out leaflets, first of all, in the communities, in different cities and towns. Then you went back and you chapped on doors and you asked the locals, look, do you have munitions here? And the reason we're doing so is because these are un unsafe. They're very unsafe and we don't think you should keep them in your homes. A young boy came forward with a black bag. So one of our infantry soldiers went out and met him, took the bag off and looked inside it, realised it was M79 and tank grenades. He turned, he handed the bag to Ben and Brad, who were the two bomb disposal experts attached to us that day. They pulled one of these M79 tank grenades out. They were showing us how to de deprime de de them, to take them apart and make them safe. And then after they'd finished showing us, they took the bag, turned, and started walking towards the UXO pit. Uh, and as they were doing so, they were taking more out to deprime them. Corporal Bradley, <laughs> he took out one of them 79 tank grenades and when he went to uh, uh, deprime it, he had discharged in his hands. The blast itself 
carried me off the warrior and I flew back about 15 feet and I landed on my back and I was badly winded and I could he hear lots of ringing in my ears. So I, start, I, I stand up, get to my feet, still a wee bit winded, and I run round the back of the armoured fighting vehicle. Just before I get to round the corner, I can see Corporal Bradley lying there. I knew that he'd died instantly. Instantly I realised I've got a lot of casualties here. In that moment, you don't get a chance to think. You're acting on instinct. And I sort of realised in that moment that so long as I done my best, that there'd be a chance. So there was other people, medics had arrived. I'd helped carry Ben onto the chopper. And then I sort of, I took myself away from the scene a wee bit. And I thought, I can't stand here any longer. Because by this point, all the adrenaline's wore off and it's just me in this situation. So there was a, a further couple of incidents that happened at that time in that tour um, that sort of uh, reinfirmed the trauma. So they sent me a psychiatrist and I explained everything to him. I explained all the trauma, the incidents, the, everything, full detail. And he made a recommendation after three visits. He made a recommendation for me. First of all, we put on light duties, but ultimately I needed to be medically discharged for the forces because of the flashbacks. So basically, I leave the forces. I went through the same transition as every military veteran does. A very tough one. It's no easy. You, you kind of make sense of anything in life, let alone how civvies work. I become a qualified plumbing engineer and I push on to work hard for the next foreseeable future, six or seven years, whatever it was. In 2000, about 2006, let's say, I start to get the real effects of flashbacks and, and PTSD affecting my everyday life. I went for a meal with my wife and we sat in a restaurant and I had nothing else to worry about in this world apart from looking at her. That moment, just that moment where you think, my life is perfect, but then your body would start to react against it with survivor's guilt and say to you, you shouldn't be doing this. Why do you deserve to be happy? I then get to a sort of a weird stage where I go through a separation because of my PTSD, because I'm not able to communicate and that drives me f even further into the gutter. And I couldn't face the reality of falling apart in front of people. I wanted to be alone. I packed a small bag, grabbed the bag and headed off. So this is where, uh, this is where I came when I got really unwell and I would just sleep under the canopy to the trees. But on nights where it was really, really bad and the weather was like this, I would come down here at night because I know that the public wouldn't be here and I would sleep in this building. This is also where my mental health started to plummet and as you can see it's a pretty dangerous place to be um, if you're not feeling the best and you're feeling suicidal. I turned out I ended up spending almost six months there and that's a long, long time. That's a full operational tour in the woods. Even, even soldiers are not asked to do that. Just by chance I remembered an advertisement on the radio, the charity breathing space. <coughs> they get me to a hospital, first of all. I've got a temporary speech loss because of the overwhelming anxieties and stuff like that and the long period of time uncommunicating. I hear about Horseback UK when I'm going through my recovery. Uh, it's a military charity. It's just been set up to use horsemanship. And I'm like, horsemanship? They're like, ah, oh, horsemanship. So they're like, okay, let's, let's go with that. And we go over and they ask us, has anybody ever worked with horses before? 
everybody put their hand up for me. So I've got the zero experience. That's great. That's what we want. We want you to have as much, get as much out of this as possible. So uh, lunch time comes, goes, and we go round to the round pen, which is an outdoor arena for the horses. And you're there on your own with your horse, and the, uh, one of the founders, Emma, is instructing you how to do this. And what they tell you to do is, is they tell you, okay, when you're ready, we want you to drop your carrot stick and bow your head. So I do this, I drop my carrot stick and I bow my head. The horse leaves the outside of the arena and walks into the inside the arena. My horse is called Blue, by the way. And he puts his head resting over my left shoulder with his head just dangling down the front there. And I can only describe it as overwhelming. My whole body was skin, everything was on end. And it was very much a, a, an all-inclusive sensational feeling that is hard to describe. It's an emotional connection that you've never been able to make with any other living being. You've just made it with a two and a half ton horse. And then Emma says to me, turn to the right. So I turn to the right, the horse comes with me. And I'm like, this is fascinating. How did that just happen? Because I can't even get somebody in the street to understand me. But here this horse is following me as if I've got control. And I just start crying. Just tears of joy. Thank you. It never says it. But the look between the two of us was, thank you. I really mean this, thank you. I've never felt a sensation like this before in my life. This is uh, this is where I volunteer. This is Confon Stables we're heading to, and uh, I started volunteering here after my time at horseback because I enjoyed working with horses so much, and it's just good to see how versatile horses can be within the community and they're also looking at helping armed forces veterans up here as well if anybody in the local area of Perth is an armed forces veteran then they're trying to encourage them to come along as well do a bit of volunteering horsemanship is one of the most basic basic recovery methods that has an effect that is second to none because a horse is like a mirror of yourself a horse can tune into your heartbeat so if you want to be, have a successful day with a horse, you and the horse need to get to a good place. And when you and, the horse get to that, you and the horse get to that good place, then in time, what's going to happen is, is your anxieties are going to subside. And that horse is going to give you so much benefit. It has got a magical element to it. And if anybody can get herself to that position, then you should be proud of yourself because it's a tough road to go down. It's a tough thing to give up in all your, your pride and your beliefs that you were a fighting warrior, you were a soldier, you were a proud individual. There's a time for being macho and there's a time for seeking help because we don't want to see another single veteran suicide. Go and get some, some experience with some horses and you'll never look back you won't you will never look back because honestly it has changed my life so much i don't foresee me spending the rest of my life without a horse in my vicinity i actually feel like a cowboy i feel like a proper cowboy because cowboys understood this centuries ago and I might live in Scotland, I know Texas, but I feel like a cowboy. The rest of my life is now mine to do what I please with, thanks to horses. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Ride, presented by Longines. Join us again soon.